And I give the call to the honourable member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have had mothers from Goldstein on the phone and in my office asking me to do something before their children die. Today I rise to tell the story of these parents and their children in this House. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, Monash Medical Centre, for example, has seen demand for eating disorder treatment increase by 85 per cent, with no additional full-time staff to cater for this increase. Jacinta Coleman, the head of adolescent medicine at Monash, says, I have never in my life seen anything like it. In Goldstein, when Joe's 15-year-old daughter was diagnosed with anorexia in 2021, her family was told this would be the most horrific journey they would go on. Joe told me it's soul-destroying to watch your child be possessed by this illness. Their body and mind fade away in front of you. And it's hard to hold on to hope when the system is so poorly equipped to treat this epidemic. Specialist ED wards urgently stabilise and re-nourish sufferers. They are not geared to equip patients or families with support on how to treat and support the patient when discharged, which leads to a revolving door of admissions, often lasting years. The stress on families is relentless. 11-year-old Esther suddenly developed anorexia this year. She's had 17 hospital admissions at Monash Children's Hospital over the past nine months—17. The unit is only for acute medical stabilisation, so Esther arrives close to death each time. Otherwise, she is turned away. She's then force-fed and tube-fed if she can't consume a meal before a timer rings. Her family has lost count of how many times she's been held down and tubed. Can you imagine the cumulative impact of this? Esther is now so scared of food that she is entirely unable to eat at home. 16-year-old Izzy has had anorexia for four years. She says her illness has taken away almost all of the good things in her life—her sport, her friends, her school. And when she goes back to hospital, it's like a walk of shame. We're treated like criminals, she told me. These are stories of heartbreak, and families are at breaking point. Around 1 million or 4 per cent of Australians have an eating disorder. But eating disorders, when combined with disordered eating, are estimated to affect 16.3 per cent of the population. Those most at risk are adolescents 12 to 17 years of age, but they're getting younger. In South East Melbourne, the Alfred Child and Youth Mental Health Service, the Australian Research Council and Monash Hospital, as well as private clinics, estimate prevalence at being almost one in nine adolescents. Some estimate that in my Bayside electorate it could be as high as one in seven and heading towards one in five. I hear stories of girls not eating their school lunch and adolescents sneering at their peers for eating bread. They're competing on social platforms like TikTok on who can consume the least amount of calories within a day or a week. When I held an eating disorders roundtable in my electorate with families and experts to try to work out the best way forward, the group was extremely critical of the current landscape. We were told that GPs are inadequately trained to treat the illness or who to refer the patient to. Precious time was wasted waiting for appointments with specialists with no transparency around availability of services or expertise. The roundtable agreed that a circuit breaker is needed to stop the repeat hospital admissions and stress. The favoured approach is hub and spoke, a one-stop shop where all clinicians are located, including recovery coaches, with a three-week residential program where the mental and physical aspects of the disorder are treated concurrently. Step-down day patient care would follow, along with at-home eating disorder support to assist with refeeding. Specialists told us this variation to the standard model of care would save lives. I've spoken to the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews about the urgent need for a new model of care, and I've met with the Federal Minister Mark Butler. Both agree that the current landscape is failing Australian families, but they haven't committed to a new approach. The previous federal government allocated funding to the states to build eating disorder residential centres, but the status of the centre in Victoria and others is unclear. We can't keep going around in circles. Mothers in Goldstein are pleading with me to do something before their children die of starvation. As Jess said to me recently about her daughter, Zoe, 
I'm not sure she will last until the new year, let alone longer. We must act. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No further speakers. <laughs> the member for Fisher. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, um, I'm very passionate about this issue. Um, we have done, uh, when we were in government in this place, uh, under the leadership of uh, the former Health Minister Greg Hunt, we did a, an exceptional amount of work. This is an incredibly important issue. Uh, eating disorders have the highest rate, in fact, uh, within eating disorders. Uh, anorexia nervosa has the highest rate of uh, uh, the highest death rate, the highest morbidity rate. Uh, organisations like Butterfly Foundation they estimate that uh, around a million Australians have uh, eating disorders or disordered eating. Now um, I'm very uh, pleased to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that when we were in government, we established the first residential eating disorder facility in Australia. The first residential eating disorder facility in Australia. And uh, we provided some $70 million to construct eating disorder facilities right around this country. So I say to the crossbench, and uh, our, and uh, the member for Goldstein and those members opposite, that with that $70 million that we provided when we were in government to the six state governments, um, here's $70 million. Go and build yourselves a residential eating disorder facility like the one that we built in My Electric. Um, not one of those states has provided a residential eating disorder facility, apart from what we did in Queensland. And that's no thanks to the Queensland State Government. That's thanks to Mark Forbes, NDED and the Butterfly Foundation, who actually got off their backsides and built it. And uh, we are now treating in Queensland people from across the country who can't get treated anywhere else in this country because the states in this country are leaving children and sufferers of eating disorders and their families uh, with nothing. And, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have walked this walk for almost 20 years personally and there is no, there is no greater uh, pain of a parent to see your child go through an eating disorder, which has nearly cost my daughter her life on numerous occasions. And we are failing children and families across this country still, even with the amount of money that we are putting in to this problem. We have got to do better. Now, uh, some will say this is the purview of the states, and it kind of is, but we are putting, as a federal government, and, and I know that, uh, well, I hope that the, this new federal government will, uh, and I encourage them, I thank them for keeping the $20 million that we allocated in our budget for community services like NDED on my, in, in my electorate, uh, to provide that step up, step down care. But we really need to be doing so much better. We don't know why and what causes eating disorders. Some doctors out there will tell you that we do. Let me tell you, we don't. We don't know what causes it. We don't know how to fix it. We're providing some funding into the research. But I tell you, if there was any other form of illness that was impacting on a million lives in Australia, we'd be pumping a hell of a lot more money into it than what we do now. Um, I've spoken with, uh, uh, um, the, shadow, uh, with the uh, Assistant Minister and I believe that she genuinely cares about this. 
and I, I, I'm going to keep working with her. I encourage the member for Goldstein. I'm, I'm happy to talk to her about this issue. I want to acknowledge the former uh, Minister for Mental Health, David Coleman, who's done a great amount of work in this space, as did Greg Hunt. Please, members, we need to do better in this space. There are families out there that are literally tearing themselves apart over the losses that are occurring here. So, uh, government, the let's do some more. The member's time has expired. The Assistant Minister for Regional and Rural Health. Deputy Speaker, I want to acknowledge and recognise the member for Goldstein for her advocacy and for putting eating disorders forward as a matter of public importance today. And I want to thank individually the many members of parliament who have raised this important issue with Minister Butler and myself. And I noticed the former minister is in the chamber now and I want to acknowledge his efforts and, and contribution to progressing this cause. The member for Wentworth, the member for Wallace, uh, the member for MacArthur and the member for Higgins and others. Um, our government is taking, or is taking a collaborative approach to mental health and suicide prevention. And we intend to work closely with all members and senators committed to seeing the change that we all want to realise. This issue is more, this issue is beyond one term of parliament, beyond one level of government, beyond one individual or one policy. So today I reaffirm my commitment to work with genuine collaboration in a multi-partisan effort to be able to improve the lives of those living with with eating disorders and those who love them. I did have the chance to meet with the member for Fisher and where he shared his own personal experience. And I know and I want to, in, before I start, acknowledge all of those in the chamber or those listening who have a lived or living experience of eating disorders. Since becoming the Assistant Minister for Mental Health and Suicide Prevention, I have listened widely to better understand the lived and living experience of people with eating disorders and those who love them, the current treatment access options and availability, the research and the best evidence. I've met with the National Eating Disorder Collaboration, the Inside Out Institute, Dietitians Australia, the Butterfly Foundation and have had the chance to present to the Australian New Zealand Academy of Eating Disorders. As many of us in this chamber know, eating disorders are serious, complex and often misunderstood. And our government is determined to improve outcomes for people living with eating disorders and those who love and support them. We're working to provide early and effective evidence-based treatment options, helping to reduce stigma and supporting highly trained healthcare pro professionals to help to reduce the number of people affected by eating disorders. And we know together we all must do more. Historically, eating disorders have received the lowest research dollar spend of any mental health condition. And sadly, people with lived experience continue to say that access to care and support is patchy, inconsistent, difficult to navigate, often not evidence-based, and at worst, harmful. Eating disorders are biological, psychological, social, cultural, and risk factors include low self-esteem, body dissatisfaction, and weight loss behaviors. While this makes recovery difficult, full recovery is possible with timely and appropriate care. Recently, I joined the State Minister, Bronnie Taylor, at the launch of the Inside Out Institute at the Charles Perkins Centre in Sydney. And there, um, we met with someone with lived experience who spoke about their recovery and what their life is like now and what they expected their life to be. This should be the experience for everyone with eating disorders rather than the exception. It is important that we have a full understanding of what eating disorders are and who they impact. While it's true that the highest period of risk for eating disorders is for 12 to 25 year olds and the group most at risk is young women, eating disorders can affect anyone, no matter their size, shape, age, ability, gender identity, sexuality, cultural or ethnic background, economic status or profession. As I said, eating disorders are some of the most misunderstood mental health conditions. Eating disorders present both in men and women from all walks of life, from all parts of Australia, young and old. Despite assumptions to the contrary, males make up approximately 25% of people with anorexia nervosa or bulimia and 40% of people with binge eating disorders. We also know that certain activities such as sports, including rowing and gymnastics and occupations such as the performing arts, leave people at greater risk of developing an eating disorder. I spoke to a medical research scientist yesterday from Victoria whose daughter is a dancer 
and she was very concerned about the environment that, well, that she is training and working in in her future, her future workplace. Too often eating disorders are, are not treated with the seriousness that they require. They're often incorrectly mischaracterised as a phase or a behaviour or a lifestyle choice. Eating disorders are more prevalent amongst people who have other forms of physical or mental illness or are in a period of distress or increased stress. Many people experiencing eating disorders also have experienced or live with depression or anxiety with rates for anorexia 32 times higher than the general population. Eating disorders have one of the highest mortality rates of any mental health condition with almost 450 people with anorexia nervosa and 200 people with bulimia nervosa estimated to die each year in Australia, the most lethal of any mental health condition. Additionally, untreated eating disorders leave people at greater risk of other health issues, including suicidal ideation and completed suicide. I met um, with a mother last week who was recently bereaved by suicide and who, as, as many of the parents that you have spoken to, is increasingly distressed about the lack of access to, to opt for care and support, the lack of timely intervention, um, and, and their, their, their increasing concerns about what that meant um, for, for, in this per, for this person, for their, for their daughter, um, and for her friends, uh, and for people across, in communities across Australia. We know that around a million Australians have an eating disorder, and, a, and around 70% of people with an eating, eating disorder will not receive treatment and even fewer receive evidence-based treatment or support. In Australia today, there are it's estimated to be 25,000 people living with anorexia nervosa, 100,000 people living with bulimia nervosa, 500,000 people living with binge eating disorder, and 350,000 living with other forms of eating disorders. Eating disorders have been pointed out are on the rise. The Butterfly Foundation, uh, well known to many people in the chamber, a national charity for all Australians impacted by eating disorders and body image issues, and for their families and friends reported a 68% increase in calls to the national helpline in 2020-21 compared to 2018-19. And the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne had a 63% increase in presentations to the eating disorder service in 2020 compared to 2017-2019. Um, as a young person in my first year of university at Sydney, um, a very good friend of mine, um, an athlete, an academic, an incredibly capable young woman, was, um, was diagnosed with an eating disorder. And I visited her in the clinic at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Um, her family were um, very far away um, on the border near Queensland. And I was also able to on her first gate leave, be able to take her into Newtown um, for a meal. The impact that her eating disorder has had across her life is the impact that we see, the severity of the impact we see has impacted so many individuals and families. And I reaffirm my commitment to the member for Fisher, um, to all those members who care and who want to do something about it, that, that we will work together with you this is a genuine collaboration. This is something that as individuals, that as a parliament, that as a society, that we must do better. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is beyond a, a level of government, um, a term of a parliament. It is something that we all must work together on to be able to advance and make progress. And this is something that I know we are all committed to do. But what does make me hopeful and why I am optimistic is because of the discussion we're having in the House today because of the numbers of, of the, the numbers of individual members that have raised this with me, with Minister Butler, who care, who know that it matters, and are determined to do something about it. I, as I said, I've mentioned, um, I've met um, with, with the member for Fisher and others about this, and, and I, I had the pleasure um, of opening the Inside Out Institute, which had $13 million of, of Commonwealth funding. This is at the Charles Perkins Centre at the University of Sydney, and it will help us to understand the evidence base, to, to grow the, the, the understanding so that evidence-based interventions are translated into practice. And it's something that I know that we are all determined to see. Another time, the director of the Inside Out Institute, Associate Professor Sarah Maguire, said that it aims to transform how we support, treat, and even cure 
people with eating disorders. The government has committed $20 million for community-based eating disorder support, and this project has been facilitated through the National Eating Disorders Collaboration. Um, and I met with Dr Beth Shelton, the National Director of NEC, who emphasised how crucial this funding is to assist people who are developing eating disorders in their first six to 12 months before they end up in our hospital system, which is what we all want to avoid. So to the member for uh, Goldstone, thank you for raising this matter of public importance today. Uh, I echo the sentiment of the Minister for Health. Thank you for your advocacy. To all of those members who are determined to see the change, we will work with Order you to make this happen. the member's time has expired. The member for Kuyong. Thank you, Mr Speaker. While the COVID-19 pandemic has affected population mental health globally, it has had a particularly severe effect on people, and especially children, who are at risk of eating disorders. All available studies in Australia, Europe and North America have identified a marked increase in the incidence and severity of disordered eating conditions since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And although data was limited, health professionals in Victoria, as my uh, colleague from Goldstone has mentioned, have estimated that as many as one in nine adolescents have disordered eating or a diagnosable eating disorder. Unfortunately, because of the limited funding for research within this area of mental health, we can't actually be sure, entirely sure how pervasive this problem really is. The elements contributing to development of an eating disorder are complex. Exposure to social media from a young age with peer pressure to conform to unrealistic ideals of thinness and appearance have increased the prevalence of disordered eating and the resulting eating disorders. Whilst these were on the rise before COVID, the pandemic has made these things much, much worse. Why? It's a combination of things. Social isolation, disrupted routines, family stress, interruption of sport and recreational activities, food insecurity, fear of contagion, and increased use of, use of screens for school and for social interactions. Those most at risk are children and adolescents who are entering social and biological transition periods typically those aged 12 to 17. Females are more common, commonly affected than males, but boys are also at risk, in fact, increasingly so. Our children are victims of unrealistic images to which they're exposed on social and mainstream media and of vicious, sometimes, peer comparisons. This risk is exacerbated in those with perfectionism or compulsive personality traits, kids with a history of family or social trauma, low self-worth, and forms of weight shaming. Other mental health issues or medical problems make it worse. These conditions can cluster in school groups, often in schools from higher socioeconomic environments. The significance of these conditions is clear, but their treatment is problematic. Most GPs are unfamiliar with management, best practice management of eating disorders, and their funding models and their schedules are ill-suited to the management of complex psychosocial conditions. Our public hospital system is poorly equipped for dealing with those with mild or moderate eating disorders. Its paradigms are based mainly on the treatment of the acutely medically unwell. Specialist beds can stabilise and re-nourish eating disorder patients as quickly as possible, but they are very limited. It's a shocking fact that there are only 35 designated public hospital beds for eating disorders in this country, and they do not equip patients or families with ongoing support for discharge. Our patient programs can facilitate access to group support, but their waiting lists are long and their programs often short and relatively inflexible. Most patients need three years or more of intensive, expensive treatment. The few private clinics which are now starting to offer a multidisciplinary approach have long wait lists, and access to them is limited to those who are wealthy enough to afford it. We need more treatment centres. We need better and more effective evidence-based management of eating disorders in Australia. We need a more comprehensive understanding of what's needed for prevention, treatment and relapse prevention. We need more support for families and carers who are bearing so much of the strain and receiving so little support. We need metropolitan and regional, multidisciplinary, eating disorder specific clinics and programs able to provide appropriate family-based therapy and individualised prescriptions. 
We need a commitment from all state, territory and federal governments to fund their centres. And we need more dedicated hospital beds for those at immediate medical risk. We need enhanced nutritional and psychology resources in schools. And we need for our GPs to be better equipped and supported to provide best quality primary medical care. We owe it to our children and to all of those who are suffering right now to do better. The Assistant Minister for Health and Aged Care. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Goldstein for raising this incredibly important issue um, uh, for an MPI. I think it's very rare that we get an MPI that all sides of this House can speak to with such passion and concern. It is a very important issue. I'd like to thank the, um, the Minister for her contribution, the Assistant Minister for her contribution, and the Minister, for, uh, the, Minister the Member for Fisher for his as well. You know, in the 80s, when I was young, <laughs> long time ago, um, there was a book called Puberty Blues and uh, we devoured this book as young people. It really highlighted the ugly pressure that young women felt to conform, that desire to fit in to be one of the crowd and how it led to behaviour that was actually detrimental to their health and well-being. As I said, we devoured that book. I think because we related to it so well, we'd never seen the issues that we felt and we were experiencing so explicitly expressed. That pressure to have sex, to drink, to smoke, to take drugs, to look thin, to dress in a certain way. We all felt it, but there it was in black and white and ultimately in a movie. We all felt it, but some more than others. And I remember how that book and that film started the most amazing conversation for my generation, a conversation about young women, about the pressure that they were under. You fast forward today, and yes, there is more awareness, there's a better understanding, although there's still a lot to learn, as the member for Fisher has explained and the member for Kuyong. There's a lot to learn about these conditions. There's been some advancement in support and education. We talk a lot more about gender equity, about the empowerment of girls and young women and young men. And yet the pressures still exist and these conditions are still being manifest in serious mental ill health and the physical conditions that follow, perhaps even more so. I know it's not only societal pressures that lead to eating disorders, but we know that they do. Pressures from peer groups have gone beyond the channels maybe that I had in the 80s. Social media has amplified that pressure. It's taken it to a whole new level. Cyberbullying is serious. It's so difficult to monitor and tackle. So-called influencers presenting images, body images that are impossible to emanate. Consumables are pushed on our young people and social trends that uh, change at a furious rate. It's almost impossible for them to keep up and they are unaffordable for so many and unattainable. These make young people who can't reach these societal expectations feel inadequate, out of the mainstream, isolated. If they can't conform, it affects their health. And it's not only women, young men, as we have heard, are also affected. The mental health impacts are profound and as members have outlined here, uh, they contribute to issues like eating disorders where we know physical outcomes are very serious. And it's not, it's, it's not only cause that contribute to eating disorders, social pressures, but they are a serious part of it. It was extremely disturbing to see that eating disorders are on the rise, putting pressure on our health system that is struggling to provide care in the light of that rapid rise. And there was, as we've heard from the previous speakers, a serious concern about the increase in incidents over COVID. And I think the member for Kuyong expressed that very clearly, uh, how COVID contributed to the rise in mental ill health for our young people. It's been well documented. And evidence is welcome that psychiatric conditions have declined post COVID, but eating disorders haven't. These are complex illness with high mortality rates from suicide and organ failure. 
Now, the Australian government acknowledges that whilst vast improvements to treatment have happened since the 80s, more needs to be done. But it isn't just a matter of opening beds in hospitals. Yes, that is vital. But we need a better trained and more trained workforce. We need to make sure that we have people there to care for them. We need wraparound services for people in their homes, in society. We need to deal with sexism, with bullying, with sexualisation, with social media content monitoring. We need to make sure our young people are resilient, they have self-esteem, they need to be believed, and we need to support young people and their Some families. The Thank member you. for Mayo. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise uh, to speak on this matter of public importance, noting that more than one million Australians are currently living with an eating disorder. Up to 25 per cent of people diagnosed will experience a severe and long-term eating disorder. Of Australians with eating disorders, 30,000 have anorexia nervosa. And as a result of the pandemic, we know that it has increased significantly by 63 per cent. People with eating disorders experience high rates of conditions such as depression, anxiety disorders and, among adults, cardiovascular disease, chronic fatigue and neurological symptoms. The associated mortality rate is the highest of any mental illness, with suicide risk far greater than that for the general population. The pathway to diagnosis and treatment is not easy. Eating disorders can only be diagnosed by a clinical psychologist or mental health, uh, Medicare professional, such as a GP, psychiatrist or paediatrician, and it's impossible to get in and see a psychiatrist. Once diagnosed, there is access to an eating disorder care plan. Of this plan, a patient can access vital support through up to 40 psychological treatment services and 20 dietetic visits each year, subsidised by Medicare. While experts agree early support is key, only one, of ten, only one in ten Australians could recognise the signs and symptoms of an eating disorder. There are solutions. Look, we know our EDs are overwhelmed. We know that they are only taking the most severe cases, and we need to properly resource our overworked emergency health professionals. But I also call on the government to recognise accredited practising dietitians to be able to access and diagnose early eating disorders. Their training and credentialing demonstrates their competency, but currently only clinical psychologists or medical professionals can do this to approve treatment funded by Medicare benefit schedule. Accredited practising dietitians are trained to recognise early eating disorders, eating disorders in their early stages, as well as those at risk of developing an eating disorder. We should therefore provide those Medicare items. Mission Australia, they say that one in three, um, it, it, that young people rank in their top three, their body image is one of their greatest concerns. Look, I'm aware of the work um, of Taryn Brumford, who is helping to promote positive body image. And I recommend everyone in this chamber to watch the Embrace Kids movie. And it's great for young people and families. And I think it starts that conversation. And I'd also like to acknowledge the work of the Breakthrough Mental Health Research Foundation and the statewide eating disorder service in my home state in South Australia. Breakthrough and SEDS are working to bring together the best clinical services and the Flinders University research team. They're currently planning, it's not yet built, um, a new uh, eating disorder service at uh, the Repat Hospital in Door Park. You know, Mr Speaker, back in the 90s, I was a young woman. It was the time of Kate Moss. It was the time when we were all desperate to be thin. And I, now near 50, look back at that young woman in her 20s who stood on the scales at 46 kilos and hated herself, absolutely hated myself, mm -hmm. thought I was fat. I was really fortunate that I had a, a mum who's, um, who's a social worker who, who saw the early signs and saw that for me as a young woman, it was one of the few things I thought I could control. And, and the, the relationship that you develop with food, where, where you become, um, where food, food is the enemy. This is just horrific that we're not doing enough in this nation. Now, young people have to not just deal with super skinny models that they're looking at every day. They've got to deal with social media. And it's just a nightmare for our children. And I talk with other mothers. I'm really fortunate that we haven't experienced it in our immediate family, but other mums just and dads just feel so helpless. They don't know how to help their children. That baby that they nurtured from the beginning 
They're absolutely helpless to help when they're in their teens and 20s. I would like to quickly acknowledge the work of the um, Butterfly Foundation. Um, there is a national helpline. If you are listening to these speeches today and you are concerned, perhaps it's for yourself, perhaps it's for someone you love, perhaps you're a teacher. Um, it's seven days a week. It's from 8am to midnight. They have a, hope, uh, a Ed Hope line. It's 1800 33 4673. And for young people who don't like to ring, you can chat online, you can email at the Butterfly Foundation. So it's butterfly.org.au. Thank you. The member for Higgins. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Goldstein for raising the profile of this important issue and for her local advocacy. And I would like to thank the other members of the chamber for sharing their testimony. Um, there is clearly bipartisan support in the House to fix this VEX problem. What is key to fixing this problem, however, is listening, listening to the front line, in this case our constituents, and to the lived experience and the families who have gone through this problem. But I'm here also to share my experience as a senior clinician at the Alfred, where I, as a, um, as a senior generalist, managed patients with eating disorders, principally anorexia nervosa, who were at the most severe end of the spectrum. These patients were overwhelmingly female. Um, they were sometimes children, even though we are an adult hospital. They were in their late teens, and my oldest patient was in their 30s. Um, these patients came into the hospital always in crisis. They were close to death. Uh, because, you know, a, a hospital like the Alfred is a, it's not just a tertiary hospital, it's a quaternary hospital, and we looked after the most severe cases. Um, and I had patients who had BMIs as low as 11. To put that into context, um, a healthy BMI is 19 to 25. So you can just imagine what a BMI of 11 actually looks like. Um, these females, these women, um, sometimes teens, were fragile. Um, they were fragile physically, but also in their minds. Um, and it, it was really, really challenging to look after these patients. One of the hardest, hands down, the hardest group of patients for myself and my teams to manage. Uh, not only were they skeletal, um, their arms and legs were like twigs, but always cloaked in baggy clothing, warm clothing, because they were unable to regulate their temperatures. And um, it was very, very challenging to form a therapeutic alliance, because that is what we strive to do as clinicians, to form a therapeutic alliance with our patients, but also their families. Because um, for these patients were in the grips, in the grips of this disease, and they rebuffed all attempts for us to try and make them better. So it fell to a multidisciplinary team to try and manage them, and at the head of that was someone like me, a senior clinician who had to make the tough decisions and sometimes be the bad, bad guy in the room. So I signed off on some pretty restrictive practices, I've got to say, things like tube feeding, things like sometimes mechanical restraints in order to put the tube down, and uh, we would often do blood tests twice a day to make sure the electrolytes were not going haywire, um, and in some cases, in actual all cases, we would start off with the patient just being in the ward with a, a standard nursing ratio, but it would always, always escalate to requiring a nursing special in order to watch over the patient to make sure they weren't purging surreptitiously or hyper-exercising, which happened a lot, or indeed self-harming. So it was a really, really difficult problem. We had daily consultant uh, liaison psychiatry input. Dietitians would come twice a day, and we also had social workers um, seeing patients and their families, because often that relationship was, was damaged, it was fractious, and it was um, very, very difficult for families to watch what was happening, and, and they had that sense of powerlessness. They were unable to, um, to turn a ship around. So. Where things went wrong, actually, was um, not in the hospital. You know, th these patients had intensive ward-based care. Sometimes, despite our best efforts, they would end up in intensive care. But where things often went wrong were in the transitions between hospital and, and the outside world. Um, it was very difficult to find step-down care units, 
and that is something our government is trying to address. So we are committing to over uh, $258 million towards fixing this problem, which has been neglected. And it's been neglected basically because it's rare, because it's gendered, overwhelmingly affecting um, females, and it's complex. We're really good as a health system in fixing simple things, like a broken arm or a broken leg. We are really, really bad at fixing complex problems that require multidisciplinary care. And this is all the more reason why we are also committing to um, 13 million towards the Centre for Research Excellence, which is already open at Sydney University, the Charles Perkins Centre, and 20 million towards um, community-based eating disorder support units, the kinds of supports I never had as a doctor. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The yeah. member for New England. Well, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, rarely you get to stand on something that's very close to one's heart, but I am on this. Um, I'd like to also, first of all, acknowledge the member for Higgins, Dr Anada Raja, and thank her for the work uh, that she has undertaken, uh, and also so many other colleagues of hers and others dealing with um, this mind-twisting as a parent uh, issue that can unfortunately come across your life. I think the first step that I saw in my uh, uh, having to deal with this is body image, um, especially girls. I won't give away the name, but girls and saying, oh, I've just got to lose this part of weight. I've just got to lose that. And you, you just let it brush over you. You don't worry about it. You just think, oh, it's a statement. And then you get the point of uh, realisation. I know exactly where I was. I was at the Albert Hotel at lunchtime in Brisbane. And I was watching uh, this young girl pushing the food around the plate. And because you're a father and you're, you're, you're obtuse, you just say, would you please eat it? Don't just push it around, put it in your mouth. And obviously the wrong thing to say. And then the realisation is it slips and it slips and it slips. And then starts the pleading, because as parents you're not psychologists, the pleading, can you please eat? Can you please, do you realise what, what's happening? Then the traumatisation of hospitalisation. And then the tube feeding. And then being by someone's bed and we say to them, you're going to die. You're going to die. And, you know, and this is repeated by so many parents. And then there's the bright side, the incredible psychologists, doctors, who can do what you as a parent can't do, and that's get inside a person's head and get to the point of trying to turn the situation around. And then later on, the understanding of other things that floated in the background, the understanding of the bullying, the intimidation of how cruel one person can be to another in trying to drive them into a certain uh, process, the insidious nature of uh, social media that is never regulated. And as you know, I wanted to go to the United States and unfortunately I got COVID. One of the most express reasons was to try and deal with this, to try and deal with this, to say to people, you're responsible. It's on your platform. Um, you make money out of it. You're responsible for it. You're the person who has to, should be paying the price. This is um, so important that we make sure that if there's one person out there, the earlier you realise the problem, the better chance you have of dealing with it. The earlier you can see that and get a person to professional help, the better it is. Um, because you don't want to go through the issue of where people don't, can't get in a pool because they can't regulate their body temperature. Where you see people who are just full of fun, full of life, just destroyed by this. You want to make sure, and we have to, we have to do everything we can, and there is help. With the Butterfly uh, Foundation is one. Mental health help. To make sure that we train the psychologists and the psychiatrists who have the capacity to work in the hospital system and to make especially parents aware and especially to be able to instruct young girls that you can look how you want. You can be what you want. Beauty does not come online. Beauty comes between from your soul, from your voice, from how you think, from how the, the actions you do to make the world a better place. It is not determined by what you see online. And you are stronger than the people around you 
who sometimes try to play with your psyche, your psyche like a cat plays with a ball of string. So um, I'd like to commend this. I'd like to commend the member for Goldstein for bringing this forward. It's incredibly important. It resides on all sides of the chamber, and I hope that maybe it's a chance that there's someone out there who's maybe looking at their daughter or possibly their son, and maybe this twig something with them, and they say, I'm going to do something about this right now. Thank you. And I give the call to the member for Robertson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Goldstein for raising this really important issue with the House. It is a, a very important issue, not, not just here, but right throughout the community, and particularly um, in my home electorate on the Central Coast. Eating disorders are an extremely complex pathology, extremely complex pathology, often with unknown etiology. Um, and that's why uh, medical professionals, the medical uh, fraternity, we often find it quite difficult to treat uh, eating disorders, particularly in that subacute, post-acute phase, as the member for Higgins was just describing only moments ago. And along with uh, eating disorders in the acute phase are quite severe complications that can be often life-threatening. We look at electrolyte imbalances, we look at cardiovascular, cardiac complications um, that can be life-threatening to individuals who are suffering uh, from this illness. And, um, and I, I want to acknowledge that this, this, this disease, this pathology, eating disorders, uh, they, haven't, they haven't been given the attention that they deserve um, throughout the medical community and they haven't been given the attention that they deserve um, across all levels of government. And, um, and, you know, and we need to make sure that we're discussing it in, in places like this and making sure that it is in the front of our minds and it is top of our list of priorities um, when we discuss it at the governmental level. Eating disorders in Australia, they have one of the highest mortality rates um, of any mental illness uh, in Australia. Complications um, that have been discussed, severe malnutrition, uh, electrolyte imbalances, particularly around sodium and phosphate, um, which have complications uh, with the heart and with the brain. Um, cardiovascular complications, things like cardiomyopathy or an enlarged heart. Uh, long QT syndrome, so uh, arrhythmias and electrical disturbances of the heart. Um, and bradycardia, so a slowing of the heart rate, all of which can impact a patient, um, uh, not just in their, not just in symptomatology, but also mortality. And and you know, throughout Australia, we have hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people suffering uh, from anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorders, and that's only to name a few. There's quite a lot of subcategories um, of the eating disorders that are being treated um, by our psychiatry, uh, by our psychiatry specialists across the country. Um, just, to, just to explain some of the symptomatology of that, we, we look at symptoms uh, such as anxiety and depression, but you also see things like amenorrhea, um, presyncope, hair loss, skin changes, um, very low BMI, very low BMI, uh, hypotension, so low blood pressure, uh, slow heart rate, loss of muscle mass and skin changes, all of which um, are quite debilitating to the patient suffering from an eating disorder. And then it's also important just to touch on the, the electrolyte disturbances that were being discussed previously. So, you know, on your, on your electrolyte panels, um, you, you see disturbances, particularly in sodium that I was talking about before, um, and leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. So looking at low platelets and low white blood cells, which can have an impact on a patient's immunity, um, and that can have an impact um, on a patient's ability to clot um, if they're cut. Um, and at, as a government, we are committed uh, to early and effective intervention and treatment options for children and young adults with eating disorders. We acknowledge that more needs to be done, like I've said before. Uh, more work needs to be undertaken to improve treatment options for individuals uh, with or those at risk, those at risk um, of an eating disorder. Uh, mental health presentations and conditions are at extremely high levels, and in particular eating disorders. Um, and they only continue to rise, and they, they, they really continue to rise during the pandemic, and that hasn't slowed down. Um, the, the Royal Children's in Victoria, 63% increase in presentations secondary to eating disorders, 68% increase in calls to the National Helpline with the Butterfly Foundation. Uh, there was a study uh, that was commissioned at the University of Sydney, 88% um, increase in body image concerns, 74% increase in food restrictions, 66% in binge eatings. The numbers speak for themselves. It is a huge issue throughout our community and it really needs more attention um, in the medical community and across all levels of government. 
Um, and that's why our commitments are so important. They've been discussed already. Um, the $258 million to reduce the prevalence of eating disorders and increase access to care uh, and improve uh, eating disorder treatments. So once again, I want to thank the member for Goldstein for raising this important issue and all the members who have spoken on this today. Um, it needs to get more attention both here in the medical community, in the media, um, so that we can continue uh, to help people with eating disorders. Thank you, Deputy thank Speaker. You. Thank you, and I give the call to the member for Curtin. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's encouraging to hear the multi-party discussion of this issue of eating disorders today, and I'm glad to hear the government acknowledging that more needs to be done. Navigating the health system to access treatment for an eating disorder is too difficult, too expensive, too slow, and ultimately not good enough. In WA, there are many young people and not so young people trying desperately to get help with eating disorders. In Perth, we have one public hospital, the Perth Children's Hospital, that can treat people 16 or younger presenting with eating disorders as inpatients. If you're older than that and suffering from an eating disorder, you must go to the emergency department at your local hospital and hope for the best. We have no eating disorder wards or inpatient units in adult public hospitals. There are no specialised care units in rural or remote parts of Western Australia. The WA Department of Health recorded a 75 per cent increase in patients seeking help for an eating disorder through the public health system in the last few years. But if you've built up the courage to finally seek help, there are just not many options. The director of the one private outpatient clinic in Perth told me she had wait lists of more than six months to see a specialist. And this was the same for all services in Perth. In fact, there's at least a six month wait list in Perth for any psychological services for children. I know many people in my electorate who are currently on wait lists for a range of issues, including ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, depression and anxiety, and eating disorders. This is particularly concerning when we know that anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder. People die while on wait lists. For people who are suffering the self-hate associated with eating disorders, the rejection of a wait list is deeply harmful. I spoke recently with a mother whose daughter is suffering from an eating disorder. She said, over the years, our daughter's treatment has included psychiatrists, psychologists and nutritionists. Despite a supportive GP and top cover private health insurance, we've struggled to find adequate care for her in Perth. We've experienced the merry-go-round of her presenting at emergency departments and then being discharged without the necessary care or plan going forward, only for her to arrive back at emergency. Trying to access psychiatric treatment often involves incredibly long wait times. I once called 20 psychiatrists to try and find one who would see my daughter. The shortest waiting period was six months. We've been navigating my daughter's illness for many years. There are no words to describe the toll it has taken on our family. The WA government is currently seeking to improve outpatient services for adolescents, but this doesn't extend to day programs or services for over 18s. There's still much work to be done to stop people falling through the cracks. There remains a lack of understanding about eating disorders outside the few specialist centres and not enough specialist centres for patients. Binge eating is the most common eating disorder, but it often doesn't get recognised or treated. If you don't appear to be starving, you're unlikely to be treated as a at a hospital. Overworked nurses struggle to understand the complexities of eating disorders. I've heard terrible stories of undertrained nurses put on duty to supervise eating disorder patients asking for diet tips. I've also heard stories of eating disorder patients being misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder and subsequently not being readmitted when they seek help. And so much of the pressure lands on community GPs who, as we know, are already under-resourced, over-committed and stretched. Hospitals treat eating disorders as physical illness, but they are mental illnesses. Many people suffering an eating disorder have experienced trauma. A siloed approach between hospitals, outpatient services, day programs and GPs means these patients are falling through the cracks. I call on the Albanese government to work collaboratively with states to identify how to address this health crisis. 
Specialists on the ground in WA are calling for more training and more upskilling for medical and health practitioners who are already in the system. Some federal resources have been promised for a residential service at the Peel Health Campus, but its status, current status is unclear. While if it happens, it will be welcomed, it will not meet the increased need in our community. The federal government has the opportunity to take a leading role in directing resources towards best practice multidisciplinary services when treating dis eating disorders and to allocate funding to community mental health services Thank you. Time has well. expired. Thank you. I give the call to Member for MacArthur. Thank, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'd, I'd like to thank the member for Goldstein and uh, uh, for bringing this matter of public importance. I'd like to thank all the other speakers. I know, know that uh, many speak from very personal involvement uh, with uh, patients with eating disorders, family members with eating disorders, and uh, close contact with constituents who have um, family members with eating disorders. As a paediatrician, I've looked after children with eating disorders for many years. Um, I've looked after children with uh, a whole range of illnesses, some very severe, some fatal illnesses. But the issue of a patient with eating disorder um, is far more complex than virtually any other illness that, that uh, I've looked after. And uh, I've had discussions with multiple health ministers at the state and federal level, level over many, many years. What I do know is that we have talked about this issue for decades. I don't doubt the goodwill of any of the previous uh, ministers involved. I know uh, Greg Hunt, when he was health minister with the, the um, uh, member for Fisher, has worked very hard to look at resources for managing people with eating disorders. Unfortunately, much of what have we, we've done in the last four or five decades has suffered from a lack of data, a lack of information, a lack of evidence base. I've looked after a number of patients with eating disorders, unfortunately some of whom have died. Um, we, we know uh, recently during the pandemic that presentations to my local hospital, most of the hospitals around the country with uh, of children with eating disorders has increased, the age is getting younger, but we are still faced with a situation where the frustrations of all the clinicians involved, the frustrations of the families have not been uh, dealt with. Uh, we need far more research into uh, the issue of eating disorders. We need far more ability to be able to uh, uh, work out prognosis for present children who present with eating disorders and indeed adults who present with eating disorders. We know that there are some risk factors. The member for Ku Yong very effectively mentioned some of those risk factors, high socioeconomic uh, uh, group, um, mostly female but some male, um, psychiatric features such as obsessive personalities, um, some warning signs such as weight loss, hirsutism, developing hair and um, in inappropriate places, um, avoidance of family meal times, over exercising, but we don't know exactly which children are at risk, which people are, are most at risk of, of uh, poor outcomes. Uh, the mem member for Robertson's mentioned some of the metabolic effects of, uh, of, uh, of eating disorders, and, and they certainly can be quite subtle sometimes to pick up and can be quite dangerous to manage and require highly specialised. Care. And uh, there's been uh, discussion already today about the number of beds around Australia for uh, children and adolescents with eating disorders is very, very small. And it's sometimes hard as a clinician to actually get a patient who is severely metabolically unwell into a, a, an inpatient bed um, that can deal with the severe metabolic problems. Refeeding someone who's stars, starved themselves almost to death is not simple. People can actually die from refeeding. So putting a, a nasogastric tube in and feeding them enterally um, doesn't, uh, is not always simple and requires very complex uh, management of, of, of uh, metabolism, as the member for Robertson already mentioned, uh, things like measuring salt and, and calcium balance, etc., dealing with the cardiac complications, during, dealing with the neurological 
complications can be very complex. Our government, the Albanese government, like the previous government, is committed to trying to make things better for these families. It's very destructive for the families. But we need more evidence, hence the investment in the Charles Perkins Centre Eating Disorders Unit, and investment in more, in, in more inpatient beds. But this is a very complex issue that requires highly specialised care and long-term data collection and evidence-based treatment. It is not simple. And no one that I know knows all the answers about managing a child in particular with an eating disorder. Thank you. Thanks to the member from Carper. And the discussion has now concluded.